I want to thank Matt Hill, uh, who's a good friend of mine and also one of our Calibrite ambassadors. How you doing, Brenda? My name is Matt Hill and I love good color, but it wasn't always that way. Um, I was a little bit of afraid of color at some points and I found that it was a little bit unmanageable and I use that word deliberately uh, at times where I would make some adjustments to my night photography and they ju it just went haywire. And uh, as I'm going to demonstrate, uh, it's because if you're starting from a place where there's already decisions being made for you, you can't go backwards. You can't go back to neutral or right. So um, our workshop attendees, I am one of five people uh, at National Parks at Night, one of the five partners and educators. Our, our workshop attendees also love color uh, and we work with them to on location in the United States and around the world to make beautiful images at night. So one of my main missions in life is to help people do what they love more, specifically with night photography. Color is a tricky business. And, and night photographers really are finicky about color. And there's a main reason for this. Everything that we do is false. We are choosing... Uh, a color that we think is pleasing. If we actually show, if we showed you what it actually looks like, I think you would find it uh, aesthetically unappealing, because the true color of night um, is rather boring. So we always are showing you fiction. We're showing you what we think is the best. However, uh, when we make our pictures, if we start from a place of truth we can make those fictions even better. But how do we know that we're getting it right? And especially, how do we know we're getting it right at night? Um, what do you do under moonlight is one of those questions. Is it different than what you do under starlight? What do you do during twilight? The beginning, the middle, or the end? There's three stages to twilight. Or, or what do you do under full starlight? And my gosh, there's so many different kinds of dark sky. And there's so many things that happen in dark sky, such as what you see here. You see that green around the horizon? That's called air glow. That's a natural phenomenon. But it's not the inky black of space as we imagine it. It's a phenomenon that happens in the atmosphere. And some people like it and some people don't. Some people minimize it in their post-processing and some people celebrate it and say, that's what happened. What happens when you use an astro modified camera? How do you make sure that your color is aesthetically pleasing? All right, so I'm gonna talk to you about a lot of things today. But first off, I'm gonna talk to you about the problems. In night photography, there's limited color spectrum under starlight specifically. However, if you look at each and every one of those stars, each one of those is a sun. So there's literally billions of light sources illuminating the landscape and modern mirrorless and digital cameras can actually take advantage of that as a main light source. In this photograph, I did add light to the left of the larger landform that you see there. So there's some artificial light, but the rest of this is natural. This is starlight. Also, I have to point out that when you use high ISOs, which you need to do to make star point photography, there's less dynamic range. There's fewer stops of available information than if you use a lower ISO, let's say ISO 100 to 800 versus 6400 or 12,800. Further compounding that, our eyes just cannot see what the cameras can. So the rods and cones in our eyes are terrible at discerning color at night. So our imagination has to fill it in, or you take out your camera and use it the right way, and you can show great color. Today, I'm going to demonstrate the following. I'm going to show that you can use a custom camera calibration to yield more accurate colors. Also, that you can start every edit from a consistent, reliable place. And you can also go back and re-edit old pictures 
by shooting a color checker now and applying that to pictures you shot in the past. And most of all, at the end of this, this is not a prescription to adhere to strict color regimen. This is a method for you to start from a place of confidence so that you can be artistic. Also, I'm going to save you time. Um, and I, I want to talk to you about this right off the bat. There are irrelevant color and contrast issues that are caused by just importing pictures. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's something that uh, I want people to understand, and I'm going to talk to you more about that. I'm also going to give you fast track methods for capturing your color checker. I'm going to teach you organization tips inside of Lightroom Classic and how you can fast or quickly apply camera profiles and white balance. So, all right, let's start off with this. On the left is a standard import. Let's say I shot this at 3,850 Kelvin, and it came straight into Adobe Lightroom Classic, and the Adobe standard camera profile was applied. Nothing wrong with it. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. But when you compare that to something where I did create a custom camera profile, the one in the middle, at the same color temperature, the sky is a richer blue. And the colors on those yucca flowers are richer also. And then, but it's they're a little saturated, right? It's a little too saturated for my taste, right? And then the third one over on the right-hand side is the same thing where I made a custom camera profile and I also applied a custom white balance from a color checker. Otherwise, these are identical photographs straight from import. All I did was apply a camera profile and a white balance. And that is the key to starting from a place of knowledge and a place of confidence where these custom uh, recipes, let's call them the camera profiles that are applied when you import something or even the camera profiles that are on camera while you're doing capture, the recipes, they create contrast and they create saturation choices for you that are baked in and uh, you can't change them. You have to apply the sliders to counteract them. So photographing a color checker and applying, creating custom camera profile and applying that takes you to a place of uh, neutrality and consistency every time instead of relying on somebody else's uh, recipe, so to speak. So let's take a closer look at it. So on the left, now you might look at that and say, that's perfect, Matt. I don't need to go any further. And that's totally fine. But when I take a, uh, when I look at the difference between the left hand side and the right hand side, to me, the right hand side is a superior place to begin my edit, because uh, for me, that the contrast and the color are definitely what I remember seeing, versus something that's been interpreted for me. Now, again, like I said at the bottom here, it is subtle. But aren't subtle differences why we practice and elevate our craft? Indeed, it is. Hey, Matt. So, yeah. Um, you know, I get a lot of questions from people about applying camera profiles. So I'm just going to ask a question here sure. at, or make a statement or ask a question in the form of a statement. When we talk about bringing an image into Lightroom or even Photoshop and applying a camera profile, Mm -hmm. We need to be talking about a raw file, right? Absolutely. Okay. And that raw file, if we're going to apply a custom white balance, needs to be shot at a particular temperature, right? A particular Kelvin temperature, correct? I do that. I yeah. can't categorically say if it needs to be, but that's what I do. Well, I'll categorically say if it's on auto white balance, <laughs> none of this is going to work. So yes. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So sorry to interrupt, buddy. Oh, thank you, Brenda. Well, that was an excellent clarif clarification slash question. Uh, and, and I will back up and say in night photography, I always and I always propose to people who work with me to use the Kelvin setting on your white balance and never any of the other settings, including auto, 
or daylight or cloudy. Those other recipes are not what I use. I set it to a specific Kelvin value. In fact, there's three Kelvin values that we use uh, regularly. And it's funny, we have a blog post coming out on this shortly. Um, either 5,600 daylight, 4,200 for moonlight. And we're going to talk more about this later. Or 3,850 for dark skies. So moving on, let's talk about what a camera calibration profile is. It's something that you make by photographing a particular object called a color checker. Uh, and there are many color checkers that Calibrite, who's sponsoring this and hosting it also, makes. My color checker of choice is the uh, uh, <clears throat> Passport. And I actually have the, the dual version that's for video and photo. Uh, when I make videos, I use the video part. We're going to talk only about the photo one during this presentation. But this is what it is. On the right-hand side, there's color panels. On the left-hand side, there's a white balance card or a gray card there. So what you do is you photograph this under a certain lighting condition. And then you process this and then you use it uh, to apply something during post-processing. So basically, you take it out and take a picture of it and put it away. And then the rest of it, you do it during post-processing. It's easy. It really is. There are details to this, but it's really simple to do. So how do you create a, a camera profile? Well, as we said, you have to be shooting in RAW, right? So you take a RAW photograph, not a JPEG, uh, of the color checker, and you need to match the camera's white balance to the white balance of the light. That's usually what I do, and we'll talk more about that. You export it free via the free software that you can find on Calibrite.com. Uh, and this is either as a plugin for Adobe Lightroom Classic or a standalone piece of software. Um, and then you apply that profile to the image, and then you begin your creative editing. And we're really going to get into the weeds about this. But this is it. This is the top level view. Take a picture export it in Lightroom, and apply the profile, and then start editing. That's really it. So, Matt, if you were showing, ah, uh, you were not showing a slide there. It was just, it's easy, right? Yeah. I'm just aware that your slides are coming in very, very slowly, so just be aware of that. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next slide. The benefits of creating camera profiles. Now, the colors, does, do you guys see that, benefits of creating color profiles on your screen? Yes, we do. Excellent. Good. Now, those color patches that you see there, and I'm going to show you this live, they just snap right into place. Um, I've also found through observation that the contrast is normalized versus using a built-in camera profile, say, from Adobe or from one of your camera ones, right? And those, as I said, are recipes. The recipes, they make secret decisions. It's not something that you can affect. Um, and when you do it this way, every time you apply it, it's very consistent instead of bouncing around between the different recipes that are presented to you. Things that I find surprising about creating camera profiles, uh, most daylight photographers bring their color checker with them. And when the light changes, you take it out and you take a picture and you put it away, right? For night photographers, um, it's a lot easier just to shoot them at home. Uh, so, and that's something I'm going to demonstrate today. Uh, you can do it retroactively, which I mentioned, and I'll demo that too. And it really solves a lot of issues that we have with limited spectrum light sources, like twilight. There's uh, less red in twilight light. It's more blue, right? So when you have, uh, when you make a, a profile with, a, with, let's say, 5600 or 4200 or 3850, or we'll talk about this, dual luminant profiles, dual illuminant profiles, it pops those colors right back into place. And that's a limited spectrum thing. And starlight is also limited spectrum. It's like all the colors, but you know, you're missing some essential parts of daylight, which we come to believe as truth. Another, other things that are different for night photographers, it's really hard to focus. It's such a pain in the ass. You're already having trouble focusing on the things you want to take a picture of, taking out a color checker and focusing on that and then going about doing your business is another step that sometimes is just a real pain in the butt and want to, you want to avoid it. I certainly do. Um, 
And then there's these other limited spectrum light sources, you know, like man-made light sources or light that's reflecting off of something, you know. And as you see in this photograph, there's wind. If you put the color checker out there and it blows around during a longer exposure, let's say one second or two seconds or 30 seconds, you got to do it again. It could be a pain in the butt. So I really recommend just photographing your color checkers under controlled conditions. You could during the daytime, you can do it at home. It's just a lot easier. And then you'll use those profiles to apply to the photographs you make at night. So here's an example of controlled conditions. Ignore the chaos of my studio and ignore my obsession with gear, please. Uh, so what we have here is just me actually testing through all of my lenses on my cameras because I wanted to know if there's a difference between with the color and the contrast between my lenses. I am also testing different color temperatures. And I'll show you what that means. So you see there's two lights. There's one on either side evenly illuminating it. You don't have to do that. I just happen to have two of the same light. Uh, and these lights, I'm just going to switch out here for a second so I can show you to the camera. These lights allow you to set uh, the color temperature on the back here. And this is what I'm talking about. with. Uh, so I can use this dial right here to change the color temperature up and down to different specific Kelvin values. And this is a tool, this is called the Luxley Fiddle. This is something that we use practically every night in night photography to do uh, light painting or low level landscape lighting. So something like this, any LED light where you can choose the color temperature is an essential tool uh, in, in this process. So back to my setup, I have two of these LEDs and they're set to a specific let me get over here again. It's bad to, uh, I set the camera. Let's say for this example, I set the camera to 4,200 Kelvin and I set the LED panel to 4,200 so they match. So 4,200 on the camera, 4,200 on that. And then I take a picture. And if I have a longer lens, I might have to set it up on a tripod above it. But, you know, I, I have a, a wonderful a copy stand solution from Novaflex that I was using. Um, you don't have to do it. You can handhold these pictures. If the exposure, if the light is bright enough, you can do it. I just happen to have a lot of grip gear. One other thing I want to point out, and this is a nice aside, when you see it happen, you're going to say, what the heck is going on? This is not what I shot. When you import these pictures into Lightroom, you're, not, you're probably not going to see the Kelvin value that you chose on your camera. And that's because the white balance recorded in the raw file on your camera is not recorded as Kelvin. It's recorded as coordinates and a color profile. So Lightroom will interpret this on the way in and it may show it as something different. For instance, you'll see on the screen here, on my camera, I set it to 3850. In Lightroom, it shows up as 3700 with a plus one magenta. Also 4200 on the camera shows up as 4050 Kelvin with a zero tint. And then 5600 daylight shows up as 5350 and a plus three magenta tint. So this is just the way it is. It may be confusing to you. I'm telling you this is normal. Uh, and this is another reason you would want to consider using custom camera profiles and white balancing if you really wanted to be assiduous about the color and know that you're starting from a place of reliability and consistency. Uh, there's a link to a blog post here that goes a lot more into depth about this. Um, and if you wanted to make your camera match your Lightroom, there's some more detail about that. Uh, and we can post it in the chat later. Uh, I'll put it in the, the description when we post the video. All right, enough talking. Let's show you guys what this is. So we're gonna go in. I'm gonna show you some, some stuff that I discovered and we're gonna live edit some, some photos and I'm gonna show you what it's like to import uh, and create profiles. Let's pop over into Lightroom. So the first thing I want to show you is that I started as a, as a part of this pra practice in my photography catalog in Lightroom. I have a folder called color management now. And inside of these, I have subfolders where I put the color checker shots from each of the cameras that I have used. Currently, I shoot with a Z6 II. 
and an H Alpha Astro modded Z6. These are my two current cameras. However, I haven't gotten rid of any of my old cameras, and this plays in later. I'll show you. But let's say if we go to my Z6 II uh, and I open this up, what I've done is I took one of my favorite night photography lenses, my 15 millimeter Laowa lens, and I put it at 5.6 because it doesn't have the electronic information to pass through for the metadata. And I took pictures of it under 5600K, 4200K, and 3850K. Like I told you, the camera and the lights were set to the same thing. So you'll see that they look similar, right? If I go into the develop module, now we can take a look and see that I have applied, um, I have applied some stuff. Oh, great. Uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, we have over here, this is where we want to have your profile showing. And I have a nifty little trick that I can share with you guys. I just want to see what that is. There we go. So over here, this profile is where you'll see Adobe Color is the natural state where it comes in, right? So what you do when you first get one of these images that you photograph, what you need to do is say, I'm going to go to export after you've installed the software. And you'll see that one of your export options is color checker camera calibration. And there's two areas you really need to pay attention to. If you have a single image, like we have one image selected right now, then you don't need to really do anything else except say, let's say Nikon, this is my suggestion to you. What kind of camera is it? And if you have any other modifications, you'll let you know, like 15 millimeter, you know, and 5600K. Just so you know what it is. And then you click export. And you don't need to crop it or align it or anything. In most cases, if there's enough color checker in the image, all you need to do is process that by clicking export, finding color checker camera calibration, and putting in a name. Now that you've done that, it's going to be processing the profile, and it might take a couple of minutes. And at the end of that, it's going to give you this. It says the profile has been generated successfully. Lightroom must be restarted to activate the profile. I don't need to do it because I've already done this, but you quit Lightroom and open it up again. And then when you go under profile and then browse, you're going to see there's a lot of stuff in here, right? You're going to go under profiles, not Adobe raw. And you're going to see there's new profiles here. Now I've made a lot of custom camera profiles and you'll see a ton of things that are irrelevant to this presentation here. Some of them have stars. If you hover, you'll see an empty star and you can click to add it to your favorites or unclick it. So I have the Z6 II at 3850. This one is the 5600, which I've added the star for. There's 4200 and 3850, right? So now if I just go in here, since I've added it to my favorites and I click on 5600, do you see how these colors in here pop? And let's undo it and then slowly redo it. You see that? This is with the profile. That is without the profile. And this is with it. So what's happened is this piece of software has said all of these colors have a specific value that they should be. And I'm going to help you push them right back into the place they should be. So when you apply, when you go from Adobe Color to the 5600 Kelvin, all these colors are now what they should be. And let me just show you some other things. So this is Adobe Color, right? If you go to Adobe Landscape, see those colors change? It's making decisions for you, but it's not changing any of the sliders here or in the HSL or any place. It's all hidden information. Same with Neutral. Same with portrait, same with standard and vivid. All of these are recipes, but a custom camera profile is here is this is the truth, 
right? And then you can go over and grab the picker and go to the second up, this neutral here, and then choose that for your white balance. And now you'll see it says 5550. Instead of, if I go to as shot, it was 5719, which is strange, right? Because I shot this at 5600. So 5719, and I go back in and I white balance on this after applying the profile. And now I have an absolutely neutral start. So what do I do with this? Well, you can, if you hit copy and say check none, you can go in and say, I want the white balance and the treatment and profile and copy that and go paste it on any photograph that you want to. That is how you would use this if you wanted it to be neutral and the colors to be in the right place. And it's that simple. If you wanted to go a step ahead of that, you could even create a preset, but we'll come back to that. So this is 5,600, right? And now here's 4,200. And you'll see that I've chosen 4,200. And I can also white balance on that. So now I've got two different shots that are shot with two different light sources and two different uh, white balances. And they look nearly identical. And if I go to 3850, which is common for dark skies, I, this one is now my 3850 camera profile, and I white balance on that. And now I've got three images that look really wonderful and pretty much the same, right? So that's a single illuminant profile, meaning like I have one color temperature, one white balance, and I'm going to use that for a single purpose. I have also, Brenda suggested this to me, and I tried it out very thoroughly, and I've found that she's right. When you select two images of a color checker shot under two different lighting conditions, and let's take a look at these 5600 and 3850, these two things, I can now create what's called a dual illuminant profile which is very robust and it's i can use this one profile for all of my night photography if i want to so i would click export with those two selected and only those two images selected color check your camera calibration you don't need to do anything else except give it a name at this point but you can read this second panel that tells you all about dual luminance i'm doing that for you now but i'd say nikon z62 dual and i might add 38 50 and 5600 Kelvin, just so I know what it is, right? And then I know which camera profile I'm selecting and I click export and I wait for it to do its thing. But since I've already done that, let's go in here and let's select. Now we have Nikon Z62 dual. This one says 24 to 70, right? So this is the dual versus that. And there's subtle differences to the colors in here, right? Uh, but this will apply across a broader spectrum of color. Uh, and I can apply this same profile over here. And if you're not into having three different camera profiles for three different lighting conditions, you can create one dual illuminant uh, camera profile and apply it to all of your night photography. And you're going to be miles ahead of where you start. And that's the cool thing about this is if you shoot one picture at 3850 and one at 5600 and create one dual luminant camera profile, you can then be, boom, popping your colors into the right place. I would recommend shooting all three so that you have a white balance for 3850, a white balance for 4200, and a white balance for 5600. Let's talk more about what to do with these now that we've done that, right? So let's hop in and take a look at our first thing. Our first thing here is... Let's look at true night. This image, I'm gonna go into the develop module and I'm gonna click reset. This is as imported. This image is raw and it says Adobe color here. So I'm using a Nikon Z62 and it only shows, incidentally, I wanna to talk to you about this. It's only going to offer camera profiles to you that are for the camera that you're using. You won't see, if you have two cameras or five cameras, you're not gonna see all of the camera profiles in this menu. Uh, it's only gonna offer the ones that are germane to that camera. 
So I'm going to pick the dual illuminant and watch down here. I'm going to step back and I'm going to step forward. Now, what just happened? It's subtle, but it's important. The Adobe profile has more contrast in it. Now, what are the ramifications of this? Well, if I use the Adobe profile, I might be tempted to reduce the contrast on this image because there's too much contrast. But if I use my profile here, the dual luminant profile, now I have more information in the shadows and I don't need to make an adjustment. And that's just, that was a revelation to me because there's a lot of subtle editing in night photography. If you're ham handed about it, you can make the structure, the, the noise in the image uh, too apparent and you can distract people with the noise. So that right there was a good start. And then if we step back, we can see that the sky has some color to it. And when I switch back to this, this lower contrast is actually better for this image. So what would I do from this point? I would do what I normally do. I would go and create a mask for the sky and I might bring up the clarity, bring out those stars a little bit, might bring down the contrast a little bit. Uh, and from there you would do that to the things you wanna do. I'm gonna duplicate and invert this. And I'm going to actually bring up the highlights and then bring the blacks down on the bottom and bring the exposure up for the whole thing. And now we've gone from uh, a raw image to a slightly edited image. Maybe not my best work. However, uh, I am confident that these colors, these subtle colors of the Badlands of South Dakota match what I intended them to be. This is what I used the 3850 color checker. I just put it into this folder so you guys could see it. Um, one thing that I can do to show you here is I can go back and reset this, right? If you don't have anything yet, you can just go in and say, uh, I'm going to reset this one too. I'm going to go back in here and choose the dual 48, uh, the dual profile, and I'm going to white balance here off of that. And I'm going to copy just the treatment, which is the camera profile and the white balance. I'm going to copy those. I'm going to go over here and paste them. So now I've got a neutral for 3850, which is what this was captured at. Uh, neutral for 3850 and proper color uh, dynamics on this one. So here's another one. This was shot with a D750, one of my much earlier cameras. Um, and I shot it at the wrong white balance. It's at 5,600. And that's why the Milky Way looks a little muddy. So what do I do? Well, this is something that I discovered and is a lot of fun. I took out the D750, which I still have because I'm a pack rat and I didn't get rid of it. And I photographed a color checker, right? So here's this at 3850. The camera's set to 3850 and the lights are set to 3850. And I made these profiles. So I have a dual illuminant one and I have a 3850. I'm going to use the 3850 to show you. So do you see the colors popped here? See how the blues, the subtle blues, which could be the night sky, pop back into place and the reds and the oranges and the magenta there. So I've got that and I'm going to create a white balance. And that definitely had an effect. I'm going to copy the treatment and profile and the white balance here. And I'm going to go back to this image. I'm going to hit reset to make sure it's, it's what it is. I'm going to paste in those values and look at what happened. Now the Milky Way not only has the right white balance, which is 3850, but it's displayed as 4000. I told you they're not going to match, right? But also those subtle reds in the dust channels of the Milky Way core are starting to come out with a standard camera, right? We're not talking about an astro modified camera here. And the rest of the scene is very much in shadow. I have separate images of where we lit up the landscape, but I know that this is a good sky image. And it only took me a second to apply that camera profile and the white balance. And now I can focus on the more subtle parts of the editing, but I started from reliable. Here's another one. This one is a Z6, but this is an H alpha modified Z6, but without any filtration whatsoever. 
So it also works that way, I found. So I have the Z6 H alpha with no filter. This is something I can apply, right? Also, I've got this, which is an H alpha mod uh, color checker that I shot. So if I apply this and then I hit the white balance, this has neutralized everything here. I'm copying those two things, the camera profile and the white balance, and I'm going to paste it here. And would you look at that? Usually an uncontrollable, unfiltered H-alpha modified camera, you have to really play with the color to get things into place. But now you can see those subtle reds in here. They're from the Milky Way. That's coming out because of the lack of filtration for the infrared, which was removed from the camera. That's the H-alpha modification. But the rest of the colors are normalized. And that's really, truly exciting that I can put that into my workflow and those, those pictures that I worked extra hard to get that have more richness to the Milky Way or there's nebulae in there uh, can be uh, really, really uh, represented properly. So here's another one. This is a Fuji X-T1, which is a camera that I keep around for time-lapsing. Shot this a long time ago. I pulled this out and I shot a color checker with it um, this is with a lens I don't have anymore. It's a fisheye lens. However, um, I could show you here. This is the shot of that. And I go uh, 3800 because this camera doesn't have 3850. Uh, and then I white balance off of this. And I hope you guys are catching on now, right? I copy and paste those two things and I paste them in. And look at that. You've got the moonlight coming across over here. And if I go backwards, you see how it was little blocky in the shadows and the sky was a little bit too blue and then we reapply it now everything even though i had like a god awful like hundred dollar fisheye lens on there it has terrible chromatic aberration and coma it's more normal than it was and now i can really start editing it in a way that's artistically pleasing and i'm not fixing color issues or contrast issues that I didn't need to pay attention to. They're handled by the color management part of this. Hey, Matt, I missed something. Uh, so that? how do we know what Kelvin temperature to shoot the night sky at? I mean, how do we, how do we make that decision? 3850 is generally what we promote using during dark skies when there's no moon in the sky. So what you're showing us now is a 3850 Kelvin setting? Thank you, sir. Sorry yep. I missed that. Hey, no problem. No problem. And sometimes I, I'm so deep into this, I might forget to say one or two obvious things. Uh, so, so yeah, this is, uh, this is pretty good. And it looks rather golden on the landscape because that's low angle moon just coming up over the horizon, lighting up uh, what's called Chimney Rock here in Capitol Reef. So that was done retroactively. This was done retroactively by photographing this color checker yesterday and applying this to that image. So now I can move forward with an edit. This was uh, photographed in the, in Lofoten, uh, and this is in Norway. So if I go back to Adobe Color, right? Actually, I'll show you guys this. So we're going to close presets. We're going to history. I'm going to say this is the import. This is how the image looked at the time. And we'll talk about what it means to photograph uh, the aurora. Um, the aurora moves very quickly, and you have to often play with your shutter speed to make sure you get enough detail in the aurora. Uh, this image was two seconds long, which is why there's not a lot of landscape. It's at ISO 3200 because the aurora was so darn bright. To control the highlights, I shot it at 3200. So we had some boundaries that we had to honor uh and and then we did this so i went through this whole process of editing it and applying a uh just as i've shown you applying uh a dual illuminant dual illuminant color profile and it put all of the colors into the places that they should be so i know that this aurora is true and also the, the golden light from the homes that are in front of me and the street lights there. And the very odd uh, halogen metal vapor lights that come out as green also, which really complements the green in the sky, I might add. So this whole grouping of images were just true night. Um, 
And then I'm going to flip over and we'll pick up the speed a little bit more now that we've established that and talk about Moonlight. Moonlight, I would photograph at generally 4,200 Kelvin, 4,200, right? So this image uh, was photographed at Arches National Park. So if we step back into the import of this image, you could see that oh, we can even go reset, right? Nope. No reset on that. I did some other masks here, right? So this is the Adobe standard. If you want to landscape, it gets even more crunchy and colorful, but it looks a little bit too golden, right? So here's a D700. I pulled out the D700 and photographed a color checker. And now everything sort of pops into a better place. But what do we have here? Uh, that was alone was not enough, right? So we are under moonlight which I recommend using 4200 for, right? So let's go find the 4200 uh, color checker. So this one, there we go. It says 4000 here, right? But it's actually 4200. So we're going to apply this dual illuminant profile and we're going to grab that and do the white balance. And then we're going to copy these and we're going to go back to this and we're going to paste it. Now it looks like moonlight. It looks like it did then, which is a little bit cooler than daylight, right? And your edits, which I have, let's say we, we go in and we do a sky mask here. I might just bring up a little bit of clarity on that. And then I'm going to invert that, duplicate and invert. I'm not going to get too much into this. Uh, but I would say I probably want to bring up the shadows just a little bit on that one and then bring my blacks down because you got to pin your blacks, right? So, so now we got some highlights coming up there. Now the arch is starting to come out, right? Um, and then you might want to just do some other things. But from, from this point, instead of starting from something that's a little bit too warm, I actually have something that is color appropriate and I'm confident about that. Some more moonlight options that we have here. Uh, this was photographed down in Easter Island. Uh, so the imported image looked like this, right? Looked pretty darn good, right? However, this was shot at 4200 Kelvin. I see it says 4050 there, which is 4200 really shot. So I'm going to grab the Nikon Z6 to 4600 Kelvin. And you'll see that contrast and color changes but it's definitely better. So from there, I would start the edits. And this one surprised me. Uh, this one is something that uh, I made a long time ago, right? This is how I had to photograph it uh, in Northern Ireland, the Giant's Causeway, to manage the highlights, to make sure that these, the clouds did not blow out, right? And I ended up with this. And this is with a, a dual illuminant. Now, I could switch it to this, and you'll see that there's really no difference. And this is why I say you can do single illuminance, and this is the 4200 one, or the dual illuminate, and the differences are so subtle, it really doesn't matter. So I'm actually recommending that you create a dual illuminate profile and use that for practically all of your night photography. And then we can try one more example under Moonlight. This is the Devil's Tower, right? This one, for some reason... Uh, at the time I first edited this, and I haven't touched it since, I chose Adobe Vivid because I thought that it made for a more uh, color and contrasty and regular contrasty image, right? But when I switched this over to uh, Z6, before I astro modified this camera, we have that. And it's funny, like this is cooler. And that one is a 5600 Kelvin, and that totally works for me. I would just change my white balance down a little bit to make it look a little bit cooler at that point. So this is where the art comes in with the editing, right? Um, let's take a look at some urban photography. So this is Central Park in New York. This is how it comes in with Adobe Color. If I switch this to, let's say, the dual luminant, this is amazing to me how the colors go from just sort of not what they should be as subtle as they are. 
And then you'll see the shadows pop in a little bit right there. And now I can begin a, a serious edit. But this is actually beautiful color. We've got moonlight coming in down here. Uh, and then some light that we added underneath the arch there. Uh, and from there, I would just start making my creative edits. Uh, and sometimes we have to underexpose things to make sure that our highlights are managed. Um, but yeah, it's a good start there. Uh, and then let's say another urban shot here. This one is in Sloss Furnaces in Alabama. Um, created a 5600 Kelvin one there. This one, I think 5600 Kelvin works out great because uh, it's a reflection. And these are all kind of daylight balance things. Um, but you could, if you wanted to, uh, go grab, let's say we have uh, Z6, right? So I'm going to go back into my library for this one. So I'm going to go up into here. I'm going to find the, the Z6 with no modification. Uh, and the only one I could find that I shot the color checker with was this one. So I'm going to grab a white balance off of that because I've already applied the 5600, right? And I'm going to copy those. And I'm going to come back down into here into urban and go back into this and paste that in. And now I've also got the white balance. So you can see the, the starting colors and the light that I added to the bottom of the tower here is dramatically different than the rest of this. Um, and what would I do from there? I would decide whether I like it or not. Um, but the starting point was really pleasing. Uh, another thing that I want to point out is that you can take care of the problems that neutral density filters have. And that's a misnomer. No neutral density filter is actually neutral. They all have some sort of color cast to them, whether it be tint or color. Uh, so in this case, this long exposure, two minutes long uh, of a fjord in Norway, has a lot of subtle twilight to it. But when I grab this, and I say, um, let's take a look at what we shot it at. This is shot at daylight because it's in twilight. So why would you do 5600? I shoot at 5600 Kelvin until it's true night. So all of twilight, I shoot at daylight at 5600 Kelvin. So I'm going to go in and choose the 5600 Kelvin camera profile. And now you can see that this pops in in a much more pleasing way. The color contrast to me is superior and I almost don't even need to make an edit on this because everything just popped into the right place. But the best part is, is that this, if I go in here and I find 5600, which is this one, I can make sure that the colors are perfect by first selecting 5600 and then white balancing. And now I'm going to show you this other trick. If you go into presets, you can say create preset. Uh, here we go. And let's say this is 5600K plus white balance, right? So Nikon Z62. So if you don't like copying and pasting these things all the time, what you come in here and do is the same thing you did before. Click check none, white balance, treatments and profile, hit create. Now it already is there. So I'm going to or click rename and cancel because I already made this. And I'm going to go back into this image. I'm going to hit reset. And I'm going to go over to the presets. And I'm going to say 5600 plus white balance. And there it is. That's exactly the same thing as going to the color checker image and copying and pasting. And the difference is subtle but important. So now we have the richness of the post-sunset blues bouncing off of all this reflective snow and the color cast in the sky. Uh, and then we talked about the Astro Mod, so I can, we can skip that. Um, but let's say you have an Astro Modded camera and you put an ND filter on it. Well, this is how it looks like with the Adobe Color. Uh, and then if I switch over to, this is the Z6 H Alpha Plus 10 ND that's exactly what the color should be. And I want to zoom in and show you 
stepping back. This looks more like daylight, but it's after daylight. This is a big moonrise coming across, almost a two-hour long exposure. And now you get to see all of the subtle colors that happened during the, that very long period of time. Uh, and to me, it's just really uh, the, mat the difference between the, the truth, starting from the truth, and uh, starting from a place where you're sort of crippled by decisions that have been made for you. All right, and the last thing I wanted to talk about is another really wonderful story. Uh, I'm gonna start with kind of the end. I made this um, back in 2017 at Natural Bridges National Monument. And at the time I was really proud of it. I thought that it was a, a really great edit and it was the best that technology could provide at the time, right? So this is a combination of two different pictures, a dusk photograph that was created at 5,600 Kelvin where there was these rich blues and purples uh, on the landscape, which I thought were there, right? And then I waited two hours for the stars, that, for the Milky Way to come right across by that natural bridge. So my original images were this really long exposure, uh, 78 seconds during twilight, uh, which I thought would be a great way to demonstrate what the landscape was at a lower ISO, at ISO 400. And then separate images with some light painting and then the Milky Way. And then I added these tea lights down in the bottom. And I wanted to make a composite of all these ideas together to show a fictional moment in my mind. And that became this. Given what I know today, I reprocessed the image. Uh, so you can imagine what I did. I made sure that I had a good color checker image and a dual luminant profile. But I also uh, ex I took this photograph so that I could use this. And having the D750 around is great. But here's the lesson. Keep photographing your color checkers. You know, Photograph them in many situations. Keep those images. Don't toss them because they can come in super handy. Uh, or let's say you don't have, you have an image you want to reprocess. You know, maybe you borrow or rent the old camera, even if it wasn't yours, so you can create a profile for it. Moving on. So I shot 5560, which is the only thing this camera could do, or 4170, not 4200, and 3850. So I have all three of them, and I created a dual illuminant profile from this. I also pre-processed the images by exporting them through DxO's Pure Raw. Uh, so these, the reason I did that is because that software has proven to me pretty consistently that it can take uh, a challenging image like a night photograph and provide more flexibility for editing, more dynamic range, and sometimes more detail. Uh, and one other thing, you can fix uh, aberrations that uh, are introduced by the lens itself. Uh, so I pre-processed all those images, and you get a raw file back from that. That's why I call it pre-processing, right? So this is, I'll compare these two so you can see them, uh, the difference between the first and the second one, right? Uh, they might be processed or not, right? But one of them uh, has more information in it than the other one. So long story short, I reprocessed these images with the pre-processed DxO images, and I created uh, a new composite, which is this one. And this one is far superior in its delicacy for two reasons. One is there's more information uh, in the shadows, and that's part me knowing more about post-processing. Part technology has advanced. Let's say pure raw is part of it, right? Uh, and the other part is the delicacy of the color during twilight and the delicacy of color during the stars is honored better by applying the color management to it. So let's put these two side by side so you can see them, uh, and then we can see the difference. So on the right you'll see um, the best I could do in 2017. And on the left, you'll see the best I could do last week. And there's a huge difference between the two of them. And like I said, I attribute part of that to pre-processing the image. But a huge part of that is the knowledge of what color is and where you should start with color and how not to 
let it go haywire uh, by starting uh, from a place where the choices are made for you and starting from a place where you make all of the choices. And to me, that is the, that is the ultimate end goal for using color management is uh, not to say you have to adhere to this, but that you, uh, you're going to have a better end result and you'll be able to make more aesthetically pleasing decisions because of it. Now, I know that's uh, a lot of things. I mentioned it before. Uh, this D700, I went back and I re-edited these images. You saw those earlier in there. So take the opportunity with your color checker to revitalize uh, some other images that you may have. Uh, I know there's going to be questions. Uh, I have a couple more things to say, and then we'll take questions at the end, right? So I'm going to give a recap because these, if you were going to take screenshots, these next couple of slides are the best places to take screenshots. But this is being recorded. The replay is going to be posted for everyone to see, and you can watch it over and over. But if you wanted quick takeaways, take screenshots of this in the next couple of slides. So the recap is how do you use this? Photograph a color checker as raw under controlled light situations for the three color temperatures that we use in night photography, 5600K, 4200K, and 3850K. If your camera doesn't do those numbers and it's off by 50 to 100 Kelvin, no big deal. Just match the light in the camera. Import it to Lightroom Classic or your hard drive or your editor of choice. Uh, and then if you like the time saver that I did, put them all in a folder called color management and a subfolder for each of the cameras that you use. So you can go find them instead of having to scroll through all of your, your Lightroom catalog. And then using the software that you can download from Calibrite.com, you're gonna export via the color checker export. One camera profile for each of those color balances and one dual illuminate profile for 3850 and 5600 combined. <laughs> then you're gonna have to restart Lightroom Classic or your editor of choice. And then you're going to apply the correct camera profile. This is your second screenshot, by the way. You're going to apply the camera correct camera profile to each uh, color checker photo. And then this is the white balance, uh, the square you want to use the white balance picker on. Um, and if you want to save even more time, as I showed you, use the create preset on the left-hand side and name it so you remember what it is, right? And then during the edit, you're going to use, uh, you're going to go to the profile panel up at the top and you're going to choose the presets. Uh, so you might choose a dual illuminate profile to start with and be totally happy and never have to do a, a single illuminate camera profile. If you were to use the single illuminate profiles, uh, you could go grab the white balance and apply it as I showed you over and over and then start doing your creative editing. One final thing I'll say, and I'm not going to demonstrate this, is during the import process, you can take any preset that you made and make that part of the import process so that let's say you had one camera and you knew you shot most of those images under a, uh, a certain thing, or if you wanted to use the dual Lumina profile, you can take that, um, that preset and apply it during import so that that camera profile and or white balance are applied during import and you don't need to think about this. So this was the third thing you should screenshot. So I'm affirming to you after doing thorough testing that cam custom camera profiles created with the color checkers can save night photographers a lot of time and give you a more accurate starting point to make your edits of low light photographs. Um, and my confidence in presenting accurate color and the best possible edit is increased many, many times over after employing this process in my workflow. Uh, I hope that it helps you uh, enjoy color, which I do. Uh, like I said in the beginning, it could cause some anxiety, but I think that this can help you start from a place of happiness and end in a place of happiness. So it's fun. And I certainly enjoy my photography more knowing that what I'm what I'm starting with is uh, is accurate and fun. Uh, yeah, I, I want to take questions. I just want to add a couple of things um, with my partners at National Parks at Night. Uh, we have a couple of things that we do to really engage with night photographers. We love teaching, if you couldn't tell. Um, coming up May 18th to 21st, we have the Nightscaper 
photo conference in Kanab, Utah. Um, we'd love for you to join us. It's not that far away. If you're in the area, it's a, it's a great place to hang out. It's four days of education, uh, a couple hundred night photographers and scientists and activists for dark skies working together. There is a coupon code here. Uh, if you wanted to sign up, you get 50 bucks off registration with 50 now at nightscaper.com. We also have the Night Photo Summit, which is a virtual summit that happens in February every year. We had a great year this year. There's a ton of replays on sale right now at nightphotosummit.com. And if you want to attend live next year, which is a barrel of monkeys, uh, it's save the date. It's February 2nd through 4th, 2024. And finally, National Parks at Night uh, is a business I started with four other wonderful gentlemen. Um, if you sign up for our mailing list at nationalparksatnight.com, you get to read all of our blog posts, which are free uh, and very, uh, we share a lot. It's very educational. Uh, in our season nine workshops, uh, announcements will be in late summer. You'll be among the first to know about it if you sign up for the mailing list. Now I'm ready for all the questions. I know I had a lot to say. Uh, I hope that I did not overwhelm. This is recorded. You can replay it as many times as you like. I hope that it's helpful. I hope that it's as illuminating for you as it was for me uh, to start doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. And so we do have uh, a few questions. One of my biggest questions that I want to go back and ask you is if you'd pull up a picture of one of your passports there, just real quick. You did mention that that you're using the passport duo which yes. has targets for both photo and video yes. but it's really important that everybody understands that the color checker classic if you buy the photo version you've got four targets that are appropriate for photography one of which is this target on the right that you see the color checker classic if you buy the duo you have four targets one of which is this color checker classic but this Color Checker Classic, this one that says Color Checker Classic is the magic one. Right, Matt? Yes, absolutely. It's the magic so, one. So there are a lot of color checkers, but there's only one Color Checker Classic. And it doesn't matter what size you use from a four foot by six foot one to a one inch by, you know, a half an inch one. We have them in all sizes. So, but this is the, the original, what we used to call a Macbeth card, and then we called it a Gray Tag Macbeth card, and then we called it an x right color checker, and now it's a Calibrite color checker. So it was created in 1976. It's probably the most photographed in, uh, thing on the planet because <laughs> photographers have been using it since 1976. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that because we get a lot of confusion from that. Um so we do have some questions that I think are really good ones that uh, I've answered a gazillion of just sort of technical background yeah. questions, but here, here's one that's interesting. Um, when, uh, what Kelvin white balance does Matt use for sunsets with sun and without this is a, I always ask this question cause it's a trick question. I use the same white balance all day long. And until true night, it's 5,600 Kelvin. Yeah. Now, until the stars are out and there's no more color from the sun in the sky, it's always 5,600 Kelvin. Yeah. Because it shows me the colors as they are. Right. I'm going to follow that up. The reason I switch color balances when it's a moonlit sky or it's a purely dark sky is that the colors are ugly if you don't. Like if you continue daylight with moonlight it looks like daylight it's unconvincing that it's a night photograph and if you use daylight for starlight it is accurate that's exactly what it's supposed to look like it's the truth but it's unappealing yeah at 3850 it looks the most appealing most of the time you might have to fudge it back and forth depending on local ambient circumstances but those are the truths as we know them Right. Or the aesthetic truths as we know them. Yeah. yeah. And if you take a picture of a color checker at sunset mm -hmm. uh, and you white balance that color checker picture of that color checker, you're going to white balance out all of your nice, beautiful, 
uh, sunset or sunrise light. So, you know, the, these are tools that we use, like Matt says, to get to sort of a place of consistency, to get a workflow down that where we can repeat and get what we want and then go to the creative place. So, so don't make the mistake of thinking that uh, you can shoot a color checker at sunset and do a custom white balance and, and why, where did my sunset go? Because it's going to be gone. Okay. Yeah. So at high noon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. High noon, yeah. So yeah. here's another good question. And, and all, let me just qualify that by saying all the questions we've had today have been good. So don't let me uh, make you think like your question wasn't good. These are just the leftover ones that I couldn't get to, or I wanted to hear Matt's version of. Does the ISO setting affect the color profile? Now, I have an answer to this, so I want to, I want your answer first. I haven't tested that. Okay. It's a question that I have, too. Okay. I've tested a lot of things, and that's on my list of things to test. All right. So please, so Brenda, tell me what I should expect. Here's the bottom line. If you're using an ISO that is so high that you introduce a lot of digital noise into the image, then the integrity of your profile is going to suffer. It could be that the software can't even make a profile. Makes sense. So it's all about the digital noise. If you've got a digital noise suppressor or you've got a sensor in your camera that really can go out there, I, I've got a couple of cameras that can go out there and get massively huge ISOs without causing uh, noise problems uh, that that would cause a problem but the the ISO issue has to do with the noise so yes it would affect your color profile if you're getting a lot of noise if not probably not so much okay so we agree on that now here's another good one how does this work with a stacking program like sequitur or Heliocon or something like that? Well, there's those programs usually have two paths that you can follow. Uh, they have a raw path and they have a rasterized path, meaning you export your images to TIFFs. If you're going, if you want your images to look a very specific way, I recommend applying all of the edits that you want prior to sending it out to a third-party piece of software to do stacking, uh, they go spit them out as TIFFs instead of using a raw workflow. The exception would be the rare case of a piece of software that feeds you back another raw image. Helicon Focus for focus stacking can do that, has a return trip raw file. But Starry Landscape Stacker and Sequitur, right now they do not. Uh, so I would go TIFFs that way if you want to guarantee a certain thing. The caveat is this: they, they ask for a really low contrast image so they can detect the stars. So you're not going to get, you're going to have to finish your edit when it comes back. But at least you can get the color right on the way out. And that's the important part. Okay. So because it's, uh, yeah. it's much, sorry, I'll add this because it's much harder slash nearly impossible to change color as flexibly and accurately once it's rasterized versus yeah. a raw image. Yeah. So that's why you'd want to get it right on the way out because on the return trip, it's going to be really hard to make it look right. Well, so you, could, you can't apply a camera profile. In fact, you can't. And if you try to, to even them up by hand, you're going to get calming and data missing and all that stuff. So, yeah. okay. Uh, when reprocessing an old image, does the original Kelvin setting matter versus only the in-studio Kelvin profile applied to it? This is a, th this is a, a dumpster fire question here because there's so many variables. My experience with the things that I've done is that uh, I, I don't think so. Um, I know that... Um, if you're doing a single illuminant and it's, let's say I did one of these examples actually where uh, the photograph was created at 5,600 Kelvin, but I applied 3850 shooting. I shot the uh, color checker at 3850 and the cameras at 3850. And I used that combination of camera profile and white balance to apply to the image. And it made it look perfect. That was that shot at Chimney Rock and Capitol Reef. So my observations are that it's okay as long as your your light 
uh, your light source and your camera were okay when you photographed the color checker. What do you think? I, I'm with you. Okay. Um, Ron says, uh, if there's artificial light, like for instance, a football field, for example, do you need a color to color check each time? Now I would say yes. And I would mm -hmm. say yes, because the clouds might be lower this week than last week. They might be reflecting off of it. There might be some dust in the air. There might be a hundred different things that could affect how those lights are hitting my sensor and my color checker. What would you say, Matt? Whew, the artist in me says I want it to look like the way that it did. The commercial photographer in me says if people want those uniforms to look the same every time, you should shoot the color checker every time. Yeah, and let's, let's be clear. We're not talking about making a profile every time. We're right. talking about doing a specific white balance every time. Yeah. And if yep. you don't shoot it under the light that you're white balancing for in a yep. situation like that, where you're trying to reproduce colors and reproduce a look, yep. then if you don't have something to white balance on, you can't, you can't come up with the correct white balance. Right, Matt? Correct. All Absolutely right. true. Uh, just you can't do that retroactively. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So uh, let's see. I got a couple more here. Uh, is there an altitude adjustment for the Kelvin settings that you use? So this, uh, Robert says, I think of 56K as sea level and 6,000 as 5280 feet. I mean. I think that I've observed the things that you're describing, but I don't make those adjustments. Right. Yeah. yeah. But I, you could I, if you want. I, I know that altitude and the amount of dust in the air um definitely have an effect on what I can see and what the camera can see. Yeah. All right. So Herbert asked a question early on that I, I want to go back to because I just want to make sure that we, we address it. He says, is there a program to introduce me to color picker? You are over my head. So when you were using the color picker in, uh -huh. in Lightroom, yeah. uh, can you just throw that back up there and show people exactly yeah. where that is? Cause it is kind of a weird thing. Herbert, you probably figured it out, buddy, uh, all during, but it's right over there. It's a little eye dropper. You just pick that bad boy up and Let carry it around. My... There we go. Yeah. There it is right there. Yeah. So you grab the color picker and you take it down there and then you put it back. Well, yeah. that, that depends on whether you have the setting yeah. Uh, in here that has auto dismiss or not. Some people have that that setting. You know. That's how I have mine set because I'll be picking. Yeah, some people three, have auto dismiss things. on. Yeah. As soon as you click it, it goes back. Yeah. I don't do that. I turn off auto dismiss so that I can go different ways. But now that I practically only use this for the color check, I'm going to turn it back on to auto dismiss. There we go. Now it puts it back for me. So just so you guys know, uh, while we're here, that white card on the left and the white card that's included and i'm talking about the white card now not the gray card in the color checker passport photo the white balance card here and in the color checker passport photo is the same white as that second patch right there Perfect. so that is the same exact color made from the same sheet of color in the factory okay, okay? Beautiful. all right and one last thing here Let's see. I have zero experience using a color checker. What is something a beginner should know starting out? I, I'm, I'm going to say mine first, okay? Mm -hmm. Get one, take pictures of it. Because later on, like just like Matt's shown us here, you may learn tricks five years from now. You may have software five years from now that you don't have today that can make better pictures if you have that image to work from. Matt, what do you say? I completely agree. And and I think I already demonstrated that I had to retroactively go shoot them. And I'm so glad that I had the cameras still. So, uh, yeah, yeah, get it and shoot it. Or if your friend has one, take a picture of it and download the software and experience it. And once you realize how useful it is, you'll buy one for yourself. <laughs>